Hi, all. Welcome to the Simple Doesn't Mean Easy podcast. We are here weekly working at simplifying things in our lives one little step at a time, one day at a time, and together we are doing this. I'm your host, Michelle Visser. This season, we are breaking down those things that we need to have in our diet daily and the facts we need to know about it. And I'm so excited that Ruth Ann Zimmerman is coming on with me as our guest today so that she can tell us all about tallow and I'm going to fill in the blanks about lard. We're going to talk some about hydrogenated oils, why our families don't use them, and also get just some interesting insights into her Mennonite culture and history and nice insights into her family too. So it's a great episode. If you want to know a little bit about tallow and lard, why they're good fats, and how you render them and use them, this is absolutely the episode for you. And if you want to know about a food source that comes directly to you from the food supplier with no middleman, and a food source that is doing their best to make sure everything that they make available to you is a good option, and they're not going to have any hydrogenated oils, by the way. You probably know what I'm talking about. This episode is sponsored by Azure Standard. If you go to solelyrested.com slash pantry, you will download my entire pantry checklist and so many items on there are linked directly to Azure Standard because they are the source for so many things that I put in my pantry. I truly believe in this company. I truly believe in the family. Um, that began the company and the principles they have put into it. And I'm so excited that they're sponsoring this season. And if you have not ever tried Azure Standard, then please take advantage of the special offer that they have made to my listeners to give you $10 off. I'm sorry, not $10, better than that, 10% off of your entire order of $50 or more delivered to a drop near you. Go to solelyrested.com slash Azure to find out everything you need to know. That code will be there and links will be there to find the drop near you. So definitely please check them out. Solelyrested.com slash A-Z-U-R-E. And now I'm going to bring on Ruth Ann. Ruth Ann, I am so excited that you are joining us again. It was so fun having you on the show. I don't even know how long ago that was. It was forever ago, probably. <laughs> Do you remember how long ago that was? I do not remember Me when either. it was. I, I, but I want will, to say at least two years ago. I agree. I will link to it in the show notes because I know anybody that watches this one is going to want to get your wisdom in the previous one too. So I will definitely link to that. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know Ruth Ann Zimmerman, please introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself. Well, um, my husband and I live in Northeast Iowa and probably... Probably the most significant thing about us is that my husband and I were raised Old Order Mennonite or Horse and Buggy Mennonite. So we don't fit all the modern stigmas of our, we don't fit into our generation of people. Um, yeah. we, we relate more to the older generation because of the conservative way the Mennonites, um, Mennonites preserve their culture. Um, we have seven children. Um, I think probably Michelle, the last time I was on your podcast, they were all still living at home two oh. short years ago. Um, five of the seven are still living at home. Okay. Um, so, and we've got one about to get married and one about to make us grandparents <laughs> and yeah, Exciting. we live on 20 acres. Did I already say where we live? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> okay. We live in Northeast Iowa. And if you hear a buzzing noise, it's just the wind because we really, the Midwest here is like a prairie and there's nothing between the Rockies and us to stop this wind. So wow. it's like 30 mile an hour winds blasting against the West side of the house. Wow. And yeah, it's cold. Uh. It is cold. And if anybody wants to see what that's like, just follow Ruth Ann on Instagram because she is often showing the winter cold insaneness of what she does. <laughs> Mind <laughs> you, I'm showing it here in New England too, but it's just, it's more brutal for you. <laughs> yeah. It's the wind here that makes it brutal. And on my yeah. Instagram, you'll, you'll learn that winter is when I struggle to keep my joy intact. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, me too. In fact, that's going to relate to what we're talking about today, believe it or not. It doesn't seem like it should, but it will. Um, but same thing here. And the, the days are so short. Do you, you have shorter days as well. Like yes. by four thirty, it's dark here. How about you? Um, well, when the time changes, it will be right now. I think our sunset is at like six twenty something. Oh yeah, I didn't mean right now. Sorry. Yes, yeah. in the Which in the depth of winter. A, yeah, in the winter, days are super super short. Yes, it's so hard. Um, and the what I was going to say was that the the vitamin D that we get from our pasture raised pork and it's very highly concentrated in the lard. I see a difference. I literally have seen a difference. It's I still battle the joy like you, but it's it definitely helps. So what we're eating definitely does make a difference when it comes to that, but I'm so um, excited to talk about animal fats. Good. I, I'm so glad that I caught your story one day when you were talking about tallow and I immediately messaged you, Ruthann, would you like to come <laughs> on? I'm so glad you didn't hesitate. So here's us two crazy ladies like, oh, we can't wait to talk about fat. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you before we get into all that excitement, because I know I'll forget. I personally, in my background, I grew up with all the bad oils and my mom thought she was doing the right thing. I remember some of the ads and commercials for margarine, you know, and how margarine was the healthy choice. And my mom, I still remember when she eliminated butter, she very intentionally made that choice. We're not buying any more butter. We're going with the good, healthy margarine, which like makes me want to scream right now when I even just said that. Um, but did you ever use hydrogenated oils? Did you ever have a time in your life growing up Mennonite? My guess is you never had that confusion, but I don't know. Tell I, me. Um, I think the only one that we u- would have used would have been um, shortening. And mm. which is very ironic because I grew up on a hog farm. Huh. But um, I don't remember having margarine available to me, you know, in the kitchen as a young girl when I was baking. I don't remember having that available to me, but I do know that I had shortening and we used it for making frosting and, you know, fillings for our donuts and things like that. That's the only one I remember having on hand. And, but it's the first one when I became conscious of the, health benefits of animal fats. It's the first one that I worked on eliminating. And it was probably the hardest one for me Mm. to eliminate from my family's diet. And I think it's because that was what I was used to. I grew up using, you know, using shortening for, and it was only the frosting. Like I could not, I couldn't adjust or I I just, it took me a while to learn to use butter to make frosting. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, that shortening, I mean, I bet you until about five years ago, I still had some in the recesses of my kitchen because you can keep it forever, you know? (laughs) And Um, well, and the the other thing is my mom taught me to make pie crust with shortening. So when I switched to lard for my pastries, I immediately, that first bite, the very first time that I made a pie crust with lard, my grandma, like it tasted like my grandma's pie. And honestly, mm-hmm. it took the family a little bit to adjust to the full bodied flavor that lard mm-hmm. will give pastry mm-hmm. because honestly, Crisco is nothing like shortening tastes like nothing. So if yeah. you're always used to your, your pastry dough, t- you know, not having that full bodied flavor, it is going to catch you off guard. But for me, it tasted like my grandma's pies. Mm, I love it. And when you were on last, we had talked about that, how food is associated with our childhood memories and it's, it's ingrained in who we are. And it's such an important thing. Which is, uh, which is also why we find it hard to make adjustments because if we've always like, for me, the shortening, you know, you know how whoopie pies are, are part of like, it's just, if you've grown up Mennonite, whoopie pies are your heritage, you know? Yeah. And so all whoopie pie fillings in my family anyway, call for shortening in the, in the filling, that creamy Mm. filling. And so that's one I've, I've really not made very many whoopie pies since I discontinued using shortening. 
because it's not the same to me. And if yeah. I am really feeling nostalgic and want whoopie pies like my childhood, I'll reach for the shortening and I'll be like, this is just a treat, just a one-time thing this year, but I really want whoopie pies like my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. And I mean, let's face it, you have such a healthy diet. You're using so many real all natural foods. If you're throwing in some junk once in a while, it really is not going to be a huge problem. And sometimes I talk about it on the show often that I need to sometimes have some junk because if I don't, I'm afraid I'll go down a downward spiral at some point and just revert back to the old Michelle with all the junk, you know, <laughs> now that's not something you can relate to though, because you don't have that in your past, which is so cool. Right. Uh, well, I, mean, I do ha like the shortening, like the cream filling in the whoopie pies. Like there's things that I allow myself as a treat. Okay. Like I, I try to treat the family. I try not to be legalistic about food. Let's put it that way. Yeah, as, long good as, the, point. Our, as the core of our diet is health and then yeah. treats are they're nothing to be upset about, especially yeah. because I have young children that are still forming their relationship with food. Yes, um, I was just going to say that I absolutely do not want to err on the side of being legalistic. I educate um, and, you know, we have clear boundaries of, you know, what's a treat and what's, you know, nourishment. Um, but other than that, yeah. 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 Okay. You mentioned the benefits of good fat. Let's talk about that before we start talking about the real details of the tallow and the lard. Um, are there any of them that really strike, strike you as this is the reason I would only have healthy fats in our diet? Um, are, are you asking about, is there one certain fat or one certain, um, I'm sorry, benefit. Is there any oh, the certain, benefit. like okay. for me, the vitamin D in our pasture raised pork is the very first thing I think of when I think of why I want to use lard instead of any, you know, bad hydrogenated oil. Yes. Um, I would, I don't know that there's any one benefit that stands out more than the other, but because I'm a mom and I'm, I'm very aware of the developing brains and emotions of my younger children, absolutely brain development yes. is my number one priority. I don't want to have too much of their diet be treats that don't support the brain development that we want them to have. Yeah. And not just development, but the function of the brain, no matter what age you are, it really matters. If you're using hydrogenated oils, you're not getting the healthy fats and your brain is not able to function the way it's intended to, because our body needs fats. We need the good fats. Um, in fact, study after study have shown that low fat diets lead to genuine depression. And I'm not, I mean, I can make a joke about that because it would make me depressed because it wouldn't taste good. Right. <laughs> but, but, but it really does lead to depression because our brain isn't functioning correctly. So, right. but it's so like you're saying, it's so important for the younger people in your family because they literally are still developing their brains. Yeah. And then even those of us that are, you know, on the decline, you know, we're past the prime of our life, like just to support so that we don't degenerate faster than what God intends for us to. Um, I do think that that's one of the things, you know, being over 40 and keeping up with a, a you know, a Paso of young boys, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, very aware of supporting my, you know, premenopausal body so that it doesn't take just to support the hormones and, in all that I've got going on so that I can continue to be the kind of parent that I want to be to my younger children. And then of course, the kind of grandparent I want to be to my grandchildren. Yes. Yes, for sure. And I'm in my mid fifties and I see the brain declining for sure. I mean, I joke about it, but I do remember things not as quickly as I used to, you know, and well, in my I stage, I, I often think it's because I have enough of children in my house that try to prove that I am um, not <laughs> as smart as they are. <laughs> so I, I, I felt like I'm just, I'm losing my mind just because they tell me that <laughs> I don't know anything, mom. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> but I have, like, I have noticed, like, there's some card games that definitely 
the speed. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. You used to they, be better at it. Yeah. I used to be. Yeah. Better at yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely, that's a huge thing. And it's not just brain function. It's all of our organs. They all benefit because we need the fat. Um, the good fat boosts our immune system. So important this time of the year, especially to think about that. And there's so many vitamins that you could be taking supplements even and it doing nothing for you if you do not have healthy fat in your diet because they're fat soluble vitamins. This is true. And growing up, um, my mom was a little ahead of her time as far as supplements went. So oh. I grew up taking a multivitamin and to this day, I have to remind myself that I don't need to be spending hundreds of dollars on a multivitamin for my large family when I could be using that money, when I could be investing those hundreds of dollars a month into the homestead to help the food that we raise be a bigger, make a bigger nutritional impact than ever synthetic vitamins could. Yeah. Good point. Very true. Um, oh, and also when we're eating the good food with the good fat, we're going to feel more full and hopefully we're not going to eat as much of the bad stuff that maybe is stashed somewhere <laughs> because we are full. It does make us, you know, feel better. It's and, because uh, our body, it's, it's nourishment that our body instantly recognizes. And when our yes. body instantly recognizes it as nourishment, those signals start going to the brain that, that the body has what it needs. And because you know, as well as I do, like, you know, if you're away from home for a weekend and you're eating junk, yep. you will keep eating it because you're just not satisfied. Yes. So true. Okay. Tell me about tallow, Ruthann. I know nothing about tallow. I could talk all about lard. I love it. I've never used tallow. So Fill me in on everything. Like, I don't even know what part of the cow does it come from? So around the kidneys in the heart of the beef is usually some fat. And that fat is called suet. And then when you, you melt that suet down and you have a finished product, it's called tallow. Okay. Um, so the fat around the kidneys and the heart is the most desirable and the, the fat that is the least likely to smell and taste. So it's the purest, right? Okay. Um, so however, tallow doesn't have a taste. It has no taste if it's the purest. Well, if you're a, if you're trying to switch from margarine and um, shortening, you are going to think tallow tastes and smells. Okay. My family anymore. At first, when I started using tallow, they thought they smelled it and they tasted it. Okay. Um, but not anymore. They do not. It was just a short adjustment period. Um, however, you can use any of the fat from a cow. It just has more of a taste and a smell if it's not the the um, the, the fat the that comes from yeah. around the organs. Yes. Okay. Okay. But so, they don't have. Do cows not have fat on their back? Because that's where do. a huge. They do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I've personally never processed one of our own uh, our own cows. Okay, so you you buy all your, I guess you buy it as suet. No, so we raise cows? our own cows, but we load them up on the trailer and take them oh, to okay. the butcher. And then I tell them, hey, I want all the suet from around the kidneys and the heart. And if that doesn't, you know, if that doesn't give me what I like, say the fifty pounds of suet. Then I also want um, some of the purest fat from off of the back. And then I, pro I render it here at home. And I can send okay. you the link to my YouTube video that I yes. have on rendering tallow. Yes. So my first experience with tallow. And, okay. and we didn't start out with our homestead. Like we're going to try and eat as healthy as we can. The health part of it was kind of an added blessing to our original goal was we don't want to have to buy things from the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. So that was our goal. We started out with, we don't want to buy things from the grocery store. So I started thinking back to my grandma's kitchen and every ingredient I used, I started thinking, wait, what did grandma use instead of this? What did grandma use instead of shortening? Mm -hmm. What did she use instead of vegetable oil? You know, cause I know what her pantry looked like and it looked nothing like mine did at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so and wait, you used vegetable oil? Yes. Oh, now see, we didn't get into that right in the beginning. You just mentioned the shortening. <laughs> the shortening. Wow. Vegetable oil was always a huge no-no to me, and it stayed in the back of my pantry. But I didn't know how to replace it with something better. Okay. Until, and then I replaced it. That was early in our married life that I used vegetable oil. Then I replaced it with olive oil. Okay. And then I, you know, then I got into coconut Have you used oil. avocado? Have you tried avocado? I have used avocado oil. Um, That's my very, favorite. Very sparingly because I okay. don't use very many liquid oils. Okay. So, um, so first of all, we got a milk cow and she was a little black Dexter milk cow. And she was not a nice cow. She was actually very, <laughs> she, she was not a nice cow. And if anybody's heard me speak at any multiple homesteading events, I always mention this cow because she was so much part of our home, you know, teaching us lessons. Uh, so after. Well, it's good. Hours, she was little, I guess. Yeah. She right. Was, Cause she was, cause you could at least push her around kind of. <laughs> yeah. Not really. No. <laughs> she was mean. She was very uh. mean. Wow. Anyway, so after two lactations, we lost access to the bull that we had used to breed her, and she wouldn't take with AI, like artificial okay. insemination. We couldn't yep. get her to. So my husband broached the subject of we should get a different milk cow. And although I was okay with the idea of a different milk cow, I didn't know what we were going to do with, with Smokey, the little black Dexter. And so Elvin said, well, we have plenty of pasture. Let's feed her all summer. And then we'll make a decision in the fall. And being wise, like he was, he knew that I just needed time to get detached from her. Mm. I, you know, so I didn't milk her all summer. She was dried off and she wasn't pregnant. And she walked around in that pasture and got so fat and her little black coat was shiny <laughs> and glossy. She soaked up sunshine. And, mm. and one day Elvin says, you know what? We should probably not take her to the sale barn. She's worth way more to our family in the freezer. Hmm. And uh, it took me about a month and I'm like, you know what? You're right. The hmm. biggest justice we can do to this animal is to not send her to the sale barn. And who knows what's going to happen to her then. Totally. Right. So it like we have to do right by her and... We have to see it through all the way to the end. If, if she is our animal, then we have to see it through. Mm -hmm. So we send her off to the locker. And this was the, the first time I have ever used tallow or like asked for the tallow. Okay. And I said, I want about 25 pounds of the best suet to turn into tallow. So wait, I'm going to pause you again because okay. as a Mennonite growing up, you didn't use tallow? No, I use my grandma did, but my mom didn't. So my mom was my mom was from the era of kind of like like probably like your mom was, where it's it's cheaper and it's supposed to be better for you to use the the vegetable oil or what the Wesson oil and all of you know. Wow, I so, really didn't think that you would have had that in your past. I just thought they would have stuck with the old ways and it, each generation. It definitely, it definitely didn't last as long, I don't think. Okay. Because, you know, I, like, it didn't skip a generation. I remember my grandma using the tallow, and that's part of what inspired me to ask for the tallow. I love it. Okay. So we brought the tallow home, and I rendered it, and the tallow was yellow. <laughs> so I'm like oh, yellow vitamin D you know I start thinking start connecting the dots and I went online and I this is when I started researching about tallow and then I stumbled mm -hmm. upon the lard and I was blown away and the and her tallow when it melts down it says yellow if not more yellow than store-bought butter mm -hmm. and I've never since any of the other cows that we've harvested has not had that yellow of tallow, but she was older too. So, you know, she had more summers of soaking up vitamin D. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of what, what started changing my mind on, oh, and then I started experimenting with how many places can I replace all the other fats that I use in the house, in my kitchen? How much of it can I replace with the fats that we raise here on the homestead? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where it all began. It didn't start with the health benefits. It started with, I don't want to have to buy fat at the grocery store. I want to pause this episode and ask you to sit down and have a cup of tea with me right now. I'm enjoying one of my favorites from one of my favorite tea companies ever. This is banana bread chai sweetened with a little bit of maple syrup. It is so good. I also really love the blueberry bliss they have. And there's a couple black teas that I love, some Assam and Niljairi that I mix to make an amazing iced tea. Go check out all of my favorites and get a coupon code to save some money and try out these teas yourself at solelyrested.com slash teas, T-E-A-S. And thank you to Positively Tea for sponsoring this episode. Again, go to solelyrested.com slash T-E-A-S and try some yourself. Yeah. I love it. I think that's usually the story of a lot of people that it's not, you know, your end, what you come to in the end was not at all what you were looking for when you're on this health journey, but whatever reason starts you on it, it's a good thing. And one step at a time, you know, and then you start to realize how beneficial it all is. Um, I do want to say before we go further, I have so many questions for you, but I want to compare so far what I've learned about tallow to what I know about lard, because- On a pig, the back fat is where you get the highest percentage of your fat. And then we do still use the fat around the organs. And so it's the back fat and then the fat around the organs is called the leaf fat. I have no idea why. Maybe you know. I don't know. No idea. But it's called leaf fat. Um, And when you process them, both of them are going to turn white. They're a beautiful yellow when you're rendering them. As they cool, they're going to be a beautiful white. Now, the leaf lard is whiter than the back fat. And I have found if I do a really careful job, and we'll talk about how we process it, but if I do a careful job of um, sifting out the fat and I I do that a couple times, my back fat is as white as my leaf fat. And I find it to be equal. I don't find any of it to taste at all like bacony or piggish. So um, I'm with you on the taste. I, I don't I don't see any negative taste, but the leaf fat is definitely a purer fat. And that one is never going to taste piggy or porkish. And then there's a third one. And I'm wondering if cows have this with pigs, there is a cull fat, C-A-U-L, that is around the organs. And when we butcher the animals are, we don't process them ourselves, but we have it done here on our farm because my husband and I just are not that talented, (laughs) but we have a great friend who comes over and helps us through it all. And he very patiently will help me get all the call fat that we can and clean it off as best we can, because I love the call fat. It's kind of like wrapping your meat in bacon, not as tasty, but makes your meat so moist. I actually have a video that I'll link in the show notes. I'm going to link your video you mentioned as well in the show notes. Um, showing how I use this cull fat around a pork loin and you sear it and then you cook it and it's so delicious. So is there anything like that in the, in a, in a cow that's this lace like fat? Um, if there is, I'm not aware of it, but we okay. have a cow going to the butcher in less than a month and I'm definitely going to ask him if cows okay. have that. <laughs> and before, like when we get ready, please reach out to me and ask me if I found out Okay. Um, be, and then maybe we can put it in the show notes if there is yeah. or there isn't. But I'm I'm almost guarantee I almost guarantee there is. Um, okay. It probably I've been told depends. by people that there isn't, but that doesn't okay. mean that they're the they doesn't mean they're the know all be all. So yeah. I'm interested to see what you find out. Right. Okay. We will definitely add that to the show notes. I'm writing a note right now. Um, okay. So where were we before I interrupted you with my my lard information? Um, were you going to tell us how you render it? Do we get oh, to that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I can tell you how I render okay. it. So um, the very first time that I got suet back from the locker, from the butcher, I didn't ask them to grind it up. So it was mm. in these huge chunks. Mm-hmm. And I just Did you have to in... remove the skin even? is it? Did you have no, any back? Was, no, there was pieces of meat on it. Um, okay. But I knew that that would come off. And I just threw it into my roaster. And that's the video I have of these big chunks of suet. And I just threw it into my roaster. The meat doesn't affect the taste? What? If you leave little chunks of meat on it, it won't impact the taste of the tallow? Well, I scooped them off. Like every time I walk by the roaster, 
I would, you know, take my ladle and scoop off any meat that came to the top. And I just low and slow melted it yeah. all down and roasted it. And then I strained it and, you know, strained it some more. And yep. then I put some into the freezer and I canned some. And yeah, it's, it's actually a very, very simple process. A lot of people make it overcomplicated and, and it deters people from trying it. Um, mm -hmm. But you really have to try it to be able to understand what people are, what the instructions mean. I agree. I have tried it so hard to make it. it clear, but yeah. Yeah. But it, it's easy. It melts down and really the best thing is just to put that chunk into a roaster and you're not going to ruin it. Like you can, you can get it too hot and then it'll taste more. But in my experience, it dissipates the taste and the smell is, I think it's what they call fat sellable. So when it, when it starts heating, it dissipates into the air. So you're going to smell, if you're smelling it, mm. it's actually a good sign that the smell, the taste oh. is dissipating. That's a really good point because it doesn't smell good when you're rendering lard. It's not foul. It doesn't bother me, but it doesn't smell good. Yeah. So when you're smelling it, that's also the taste dissipating hmm. into the air. Good and it's point. the same It's the same when I make tallow lotion, you know, for my face, for the family's okay. you know, moisturizing needs. Um, people will try it and they'll say, well, it smells like beef. And my family doesn't even think about it anymore. You mm -hmm. know, you get accustomed to it. But also, wait two minutes and smell your skin. Does it still smell like beef? Mm -hmm. No. It's just that initial, the first time you put it on. And then I leave mine in an open container in the bathroom. Okay. And, but there again, I've gotten accustomed to the smell. I would rather have, I always tell people, I'd rather have the beef smell on my skin. I'd rather smell like beef than the synthetic fab, uh, fragrance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> no, same. Um, um, okay. So the difference I'm thinking with what you described with yours and with lard, I do, and maybe it doesn't matter though. I do make a conscious effort to remove any skin. Now I will get slabs as well when the pig comes back of the back fat, but I did after a few years of having to remove that pig skin, <laughs> I asked our friend, could you take that off? And he's great. He's like, oh yeah. So he will, and he'll even cut it for me. Now, I think you were going to get to that, that do you now have your suet ground or cut? Um, off? Well, it, it costs extra to have it ground. Okay. So I kind of look at my schedule and I think, how much time do I have? If I have a week, you know, if I have a day where it doesn't matter and I can walk by and scoop off the cracklings or, you know. Then it, then I just get it in a big chunk, um, cause it costs. Oh, so do you not cut it up? Cause I will still cut it up into no. like, well, I don't know. it usually comes already frozen. Right. So they put it in okay. their flash freezer and then it's frozen and no, I don't let it out on the counter and let it get soft. I just throw it into my roaster oh, and well, start that's good it to really, know. really slow. Hmm. And then it, it defrosts and starts melting over the next six, 12 hours. Um, okay. But see, with a with a cow, it's different because they skin it, so there's right. never any skin on right. the on the tallow. Okay, and then with our call fat, there is a layer of what do I want to call it? Membrane between yeah. the fat and the organs. So you don't have to pull it off. You can also take that out as you're walking by, like you were saying. But I'll often try and just kind of pull off the membrane before I put it in the pot. But you probably have that too. Some I've sort of never found any membrane no. on okay. my suet. It's just like little pieces of meat that, yeah, then get roasted and, and they float to the top and I scoop them off. Okay. So there are a good number of differences actually between tallow and lard, I'm finding, the more that you talk. Um, and then I also, I don't know if I'm just overly anal because someone once told me this, <laughs> but I will measure every half an hour, I'll go back and I'll check the temperature of the liquid fat in the bottom of my big stock pan and I'll try to keep it as close to 2 to 220 as I can. And if it goes over 220, that's when I go, oh, I got to lower it and I got to watch it a little more closer. Just because I'm afraid it will be more pig tasting if it gets too boiling or gets too hot. Like the slower steady is going to give you the better taste is what I've always thought. I've never pract I've never tried another way because I don't want to have bad tasting lard. So I don't <laughs> I've just never tried it. But maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. I think uh. I think it does matter. Um, I, I kind of am more just, I look 
you know, I have a thermometer on my, on my roaster. And although I don't measure the actual tallow that I'm melting, you don't want it to smoke, you know? So okay. I, I err, I'm just like you, I err on the side of, I'd rather have it take a day longer and let it lower right. than to hurry it along. Yeah. Yeah. But like you had said earlier, it is such an easy process that I think it's, I think there's a lot of things in the real food world like this, that they're not complicated, but they're intimidating. And if we just do it, just jump in and try it, we realize, oh, I can do that. And for me, I might have to do it two or three times before I finally say, okay, that wasn't complicated, you know, because it takes me a little bit of time to get used to the process and to get comfortable with, oh, I did this. <laughs> and that's how it was with lard for me. It took me a few times to be I able think, to say that. I think you're, that's exactly how I am. When I feel like I've mastered something, when <laughs> this is going to be so, it sounds so simple and silly, but when I can do it with minimal amount of dirty dishes, because when I have hmm. not, when I've not yet mastered something, I'm not, I don't know exactly which ladle I need or which <laughs> dish I need. So I've got all these dishes spread all over the counter, uh -huh. but I feel like I've mastered something when I only had one or two dishes and I know exactly what the process is. Then I'm like, yeah. okay, this wasn't as complicated, but if I have to wash a whole sink full of dishes, I feel yeah. like it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other complication to it all is you do have to be at home. I mean, you could turn it off, I guess. Have you ever done that? Have you turned it off and set it aside half a day or something? I've actually turned it down to warm um, just to keep it warm so I don't lose my momentum. Mm -hmm. And when we've had to go to piano lessons or something like that, okay, I've actually turned it down and then come home and turned it back up. Okay. So you don't even have to be home all day. You can even take a break from it. So You can. It all just depends on how comfortable you are leaving a roaster full of hot, hot grease, you know, yeah. connected to the electricity in your house. <laughs> Good point. It is hot grease. That is something for sure. Um, okay. So if folks, I, I know, and I'm going to put in the show notes, you can buy tallow. You can buy lard. I do want to caution anybody listening who's thinking they want to go do that. Make sure it's not hydrogenated. I, am I saying it correctly? Hyd hydrogenated? Hydro yeah. Is that the right term or is it hydro? So. <laughs> I think Hydro that's what I'm trying to say. Hydrogenated or hydronated? Yeah. Hydrogenated, right? Yeah. Um, make sure that it's not that. You want genuine pork lard or genuine beef tallow. And I will link sources for both of those in the show notes. But if somebody has to go do that, if they'd have no access to it, they don't have pigs like we do or cows like you do, which one should they get? My guess is it's that really depends on what they're going to be doing with it. Um, like for lard, I use it in baking in place of butter. Do you do that with tallow? Only when I run into a pinch. Okay. Um, I will use my tallow. I have used tallow in baking and it works just fine. I okay. prefer to use lard or butter um, just because I'm more consistent. My results with lard and butter are more consistent with modern recipes when you're switching out, like say olive oil or, um, you know, any other hydrogenated oils. Lard and tallow, I mean, lard and butter gives more of a similar result to what you want, what you're used to your recipe turning out. Okay. You know, how you're used to your recipe turning out if you're using a modern recipe. I use tallow mostly for my, like making lotion mm -hmm. and I will use it in my cast iron as, you know, as much as I can because we, we for the last couple of years have had more tallow than lard. So I'm always looking for ways to use tallow instead of lard. So it, it makes a beautiful, you know, cast iron. If you're going to do anything in your cast iron, throwing some tallow in first will make it nonstick. So beautifully nonstick. And I know lard works the same way, but I've it just does. not, I want to save the lard that I have because I love baking pies and it makes mm. the best pie crust. It does. So it my does. lard is for more for special occasion. Because, mostly because of this, and you tell me if there's a better way. My lard comes in tubs and I store it in the freezer. 
And we are at a stage of life where my freezer is always full of meat and I have limited freezer space. Yep. And maybe the solution's as simple as getting a whole freezer just for lard and butter. <laughs> That's a simple solution, sure. <laughs> a solution. Um, so for that reason, I don't usually have as much lard as I have tallow because although I do put some tallow in the freezer, my tallow, I can can. I'll pressure can it and put it on the shelf um, if I run out of freezer space. So tell I was me, actually going to... I was going to ask you about that a minute ago when you said that you can some of your tallow. I was going to say, wait, do you actually process it? So you do. You put it through the canner. Yeah, I, I put don't. It, I pressure can it. I don't can lard. I no. simply pour the hot lard after it's been strained multiple times. I pour it into the prepared jar. And as it hardens, I mean, I'll immediately put the lid on, the rim and the, the lid on, and it, it seals. So it's a sealed jar and I don't need to do anything else. And it keeps in our root cellar for years. Well, it, yeah, because it, it's shelf stable. It's it is. shelf stable anyway, even without being sealed. I need to do some more research and see because I know that tallow, when rendered properly, is also shelf stable. Like it doesn't turn rancid if it's pure. Right. Right. And I'll leave my jar of lard that I'm using for the purpose you just said to put the oil in my cast iron skillet. I keep it right by the stove at room temperature yes. year round. Did your grandma used to do that? <laughs> yes, she did. She had a tub of bacon grease and lard. Yeah. She kept everything yeah. out on her counter. Yeah. 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 I like um, the that other thing idea. that I, the other thing that I'll do now, this does require freezer space, but <laughs> it takes up a good amount of space in our freezers. Um, I will turn some of my lard, the one that's that whiter one I mentioned, the leaf lard, I usually turn all of that into sticks and I will freeze the sticks. So I have multiple molds and they're half cup sticks, just like butter. So I can just pull them out. Unfortunately, I don't usually think of it far, far enough ahead and I have to defrost it some, but I pull them out of the freezer and use it in place of butter in my baking. Yeah. So, and see, for me, I don't, right now, I'm not using a lot of tallow and lard in my baking because I have butter. I have so much butter right now because I have a Jersey cow that's in And milk. that is, that's the better thing to use for sure. Oh, I'm so jealous. I would love but, to have yeah. some amazing butter. But my, my fats, the fats in our family, like in my kitchen, they stack up with how much do I have of each yeah. thing. So yep. here, here shortly, I'll take stock of how much butter I have. And then we've got pigs going to harvest and we've got a cow going to harvest. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, and then we'll be drying off a cow. So then, then it'll all prioritize, it'll, yeah. priorities will change. And I'll be like, I have so much tallow. Let's use tallow for this and tallow for that. And let's yep. make candles and yep. yeah. 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 There are other things I will do and tips I give when people want to bake with lard. So I'm going to just put that in the show notes as well, because I have a whole article written about that. But um, I also sometimes will use half butter and half lard, depending on what I'm making, because you do want that butter taste. It's so good. Well, and it, it's um, using the half and half. That's my biggest tip for when you're learning to cook from scratch Yes. and learning to switch out ingredients. Don't go cold turkey on your family. Yes. They're not going to like that. You're going to be okay with it. <laughs> Because you've already chosen nutrition over taste, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be okay with it. But they, like the kids, they're not going to, and even husbands sometimes, mm -hmm. they, oh, they're not are you gonna kidding? appreciate going to Bill's culture. my biggest one that will complain first. <laughs> yeah. And it's true with fresh flour too, by the way. And yes. never just try and go to right to fresh ground flour because no, that's they gonna... can't handle that big, no. they can't handle that huge amount of flavor in something mm -hmm. that they thought was going to taste like cardboard. Yes, exactly. They like their cardboard. <laughs> yeah, it's just unexpected. And it, it's kind of yeah. like, you know, when you take a drink of something and you were, you thought it was going to be water, but it's Sprite or something like that. It's not that you don't like Sprite, but your immediate reaction is to put it away from you, right? Yeah. So, and it's the same way with baked goods. They weren't there when you made it. So their expectation is that it's going to taste exactly the same as it did last time you made it. So if it doesn't, you're going to know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. And sometimes even 
if they know that it's the more nutritious version in any way, they're going to be on guard. <laughs> then they're suspicious. Yes. And if you've done it too many times, if you've done it too many times where you've tried to say, no, it's just the same, it's just the yeah. same, and they know it's not, you, mean, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Believe me, I know. You can't pass it off as the real thing to them. It's so true. So true. Uh, well, before we wrap up, forgetting about lard and fat and tallow for a minute, what do you have any tips for picky eaters or any more tips of what you're giving me right now? Because it's good stuff. Neil, do I have, I have a, I have a lot of picky eaters. I have a couple, let me say I have a couple of real picky eaters at uh, our table and my best advice is to take it slow, take it really, really slow and remove things, you know, I, re for example, um, like say chips, like those bags of chips that were my kids like to put in their lunch uh -huh. used to be, they thought they had to have them every time. Well, uh, here again, I was motivated by saving money and not having to buy things from the grocery store more than I was motivated by nutrition. And then the uh -huh. nutrition is what keeps me, you know, yeah, keeps me consistent the benefits that I've seen by removing those types of snacks. So first we started, um, for example, I would buy two boxes of those snack bags of chips and they'd last almost a month. And I'd take a monthly trip to the big grocery store. So if we ran out before we went to the grocery store, that was it. I'm not making a special trip just for chips. Right. So then I cut back. I started buying one box of chips and made sure there was um, like, seasoned pretzels and popcorn and other snacks available. So then I cut all the way back to saying these are for special occasions only. I will get them when, you know, when I'm going out of town or we have a big busy week and mom doesn't have time to pop popcorn for you. Um, and they've actually stopped asking for them. Hmm. But hmm. I did that over probably 18 months. Hmm. Wow. It, well, don't and, remind them that they haven't asked for them because no. that wouldn't be. <laughs> well, they still see them at the grocery store. And when we go by, walk by them and they ask for them, I'm like, oh, you know what? I kind of plan to get you those when I go to Virginia, then you can have them as a treat in your lunch that week. You know, things, uh -huh. you know, so I usually, you know, tell them, oh, you, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll get them for you when, you uh -huh. know, try not to be legalistic and say, no, we yep. don't use those in our lunches anymore. Yep. Again, so, going full circle in our conversation. I'm glad you brought that up again. That's so important. Yes. yes. It's so, and you know, sometimes just being okay with, they're not going to like everything and that's yeah. okay. And then my older children, um, that, you know, have picky tendencies, I keep reminding them that God did not intend for them to stay the same way their entire lives. And groweth comes by stretching themselves. Mm -hmm. Like God, you know, God intends for us to keep growing our entire lives, but we can't do that if we don't stretch ourselves beyond our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I do think as adults, they're more willing to try things with an open mind. At least that's what I find in my, with my, I have one girl who was a very picky eater. And now the things that she eats, I tell her often, I'm so proud of you, <laughs> you know, and well, it's not I mom wonder, telling her to eat it. I wonder if some of that comes when we take pressure off, when they are yeah. completely a hundred percent responsible for their own nutrition, you know, and, and we're not there telling them what they should and shouldn't eat. Maybe, maybe it's just like other things in life. The more we give them the freedom to experiment and make yeah. mistakes, the sooner they will develop that. Yeah. You know, possibly it's one of those things. It could but be. yeah, a real simple phrase that I use with my children is you can not only eat your favorite foods, you, your diet cannot only consist of your favorite foods. Mm -hmm. And that kind of reminds them then that, oh, I can eat things that aren't my favorite. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Do you, what's your policy if it's something that they just really don't like and you know, they just don't like it. Do you just let them pass that at the dinner table? If it's a veggie, they just can't stand or. Well, it depends on, like, let's say asparagus. Um, I love we asparagus. Only, we do not freeze asparagus or can it. So we only. Oh, have so they a, get like, sick of it. No, no, they <laughs> no? don't. They don't try it enough. They don't try oh, it often enough. Oh, okay. Because we only have it a couple times each spring. 
And okay. so they don't they don't have enough exposure to it. So I'm willing to let that one slide. Okay. They, I mean, they all have to try a tiny little bit. Okay. But say my my 16 year old, he dislikes green beans, mm. and I've been serving him green beans forever you know since he was yeah. a little boy and to this day he like there's a rule that you've got to try some and it used to be however old you are if you're six then you have to eat six green beans oh. um, but he his taste has not grown with his age <laughs> <laughs> so I just ask that they take a couple to keep their okay. palate you know accustomed to it but you know, as a whole, I'm offering them such a wide variety of healthy, nutritious food that yeah. I don't I don't worry about it too much. But I also know that when you have preschoolers, you, it's a little more concerning. And I don't have any preschoolers anymore. Um, you're just a little more concerned when they're little because you you worry more about their complete nutrition. Yeah. But they all, like I would say, just be consistent, keep offering and ask them to take a couple bites and then be okay with that. Yep. Yep. And then for me, I have the same picky eater I'm thinking of. There was tomatoes. She just absolutely despised them. And after enough tastes of them over the years, I finally said, that's okay. That's fine. No more tomatoes ever the rest of your life, if that's what you choose, you know, and I just stopped ever asking her to take any taste of tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, tomatoes so. are a hard one. And because my husband doesn't like fresh tomatoes, I don't push them on mm. the children. But there's a there's um, what are they? I think they're they're tiny little yellow tomatoes. And uh, they're pear they're, ones, maybe they're even tinier than like a grape tomato. I think they're called okay. sun golds. And they're real tiny okay. and they're super, super sweet. And even my reluctant tomato eaters will try those. And they say the tomato is so tiny that you don't get that texture all over your mouth hmm. when you eat it. So okay. they've been able to try some of those and, and they've said they're okay, but they don't love them. Okay. Okay. Well, I just have to put on record that I absolutely love garden tomatoes. Love them. I can make a whole meal of just tomatoes, I think. So. <laughs> I do like tomatoes, too. I'm not crazy over them, um, but I do like tomatoes. Mm. Well, this has been fun, and I'm going to definitely look up some more about tallow. And you let me know about if there's any such thing as call fat on beef, and I'm going to make sure that goes in the notes. I and will. I'm going to... Definitely link to your video of how that you render it. And I'll put all my information about lard in the show notes. And hopefully we've helped clear up a little confusion over the good fats and the bad fats. <laughs> well, it so, has been a pleasure chatting with you. You too, Ruth Ann. It's, I, I love sitting down and talking with you. Um, tell everybody where they can find you. Okay. Um, on Instagram, I am Ruth Ann Zim. And then on YouTube, I am homesteading with the Zimmermans or um, YouTube has changed the way they put your tag or your, your URL. You mm -hmm. can put YouTube at Ruth Ann Zim and you'll be able to find me that way. Oh, okay. Great. And I'll link all that in the show notes too. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ruth Ann. Thanks, Michelle. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. I seriously hope that one day I get to sit down and chat like that with Ruth Ann in person because she is one of the sweetest friends I have made in my online community of friends. And, you know, I'll probably have her back on again someday because she's just, she's a great friend. And I love talking with her. And she always has such encouraging, great things to share. Be sure that you go to solelyrested.com slash Azure and support this season's sponsor by checking out what they're all about. And that limited time code is there for your use as well. Solelyrested.com slash A-Z-U-R-E. So that's all I have for you today. I'm excited about next week's episode. Please join me then. And as of for today, thanks for being here. And remember. It is easy to forget how blessed we are to live this life. So enjoy those simple everyday efforts. They aren't easy, but it's a good life.